we have been discussing emotions for the past couple of quarters. And today we will discuss the crippling emotion of procrastination. I don't know about you, but it is very easy to put off something I don't want to do. 2,000 years ago, in prosperous Pompeii City that was nestled on the coast of Italy, on the Bay of Naples, 10 miles away from the beautiful Mount Vesuvius. About 20,000 people lived in Pompeii. 5,000 lived eight miles away in the smaller town of Herculaneum. Since it had not erupted for over a thousand years, everybody had forgotten that the mountain was even a volcano. By 79 AD, Pompeii and Herculaneum had become the playground for the wealthy Romans with the time and the inclination for enjoying the opulent baths, the brothels, the alternate lifestyle establishments, the gambling dens, the gladiator exhibitions in the 20,000 seat arena. It was the whole city, perverted, promiscuous, deviant behavior was accepted as the norm. Residents and visitors enjoyed not only the mild climate, but also running water. Pompeii was connected and to uh, uh, the Sereno Aqueduct. It was a marvel of engineering. The route of the aqueduct is on your screen. It was built under the rule of King Agrippa, starting in 33 BC before Christ and building until 12 AD. And it was a marvel of engineering. It was a series of very large tunnels and pipes and canals and brick tube structures that combined to channel the water by gravity from freshwater lakes and rivers into the cities. The infrastructure of the water towers and the lead pipes brought the water right into the businesses. There were public drinking fountains, which by the way are still there, you can still drink out of them. There were public toilets, public bathhouses, and many, many of the beautiful villas had indoor luxurious swimming pools, all tiled, that are still there, you can still see them. Painted on the walls of many rooms unearthed by the archeologist, are pornographic scenes of debased perversions that most certainly rivaled, if not exceeded, Sodom and Gomorrah. It was hard for me to find a room without pictures that I could put up on a screen for Christians to see. They were almost all with tile and painting portraits. One of the gods of Pompeii was the god Vulcan the god of fire. The annual celebration and sacrifice to the god Vulcan was held each August 23rd. The daytime was a matter of feasting and dancing and the gladiator fighting, followed by a night of revelry around great huge bonfires. And onto these bonfires, they threw live fish as their sacrifice to appease the god Vulcan. Now for weeks prior to the exciting yearly Vulcan festivities, servants were sent into the hills and onto Mount Vesuvius to cut and stack piles of wood, giving it time to dry for the big bonfires. Several years before this, the area started experiencing almost imperceptible earth tremors. The tremors caused momentary alarm. Nothing too frightening, just, just quick shakes 
that caused you to pause and then everything was silent and people went back to doing whatever they were doing at the moment. Nobody understood that the mountain in their midst was a volcano. Many homeowners noted water sloshing in their indoor swimming pools when nobody was near the pool. Many wrote about wine in their glass sitting on the table and suddenly the wine is moving and shaking in the glass. Days before the 79 AD celebration to the god Vulcan, all the running water into the cities stopped, which was a tragedy to them because this was a holiday with many visitors from um, all over Italy. And they, what in the world has cut off the flow of water which had never been disrupted since the aqueduct was put in? However, within a few days, the men came and walked through the aqueduct and they traced the problem to a large rupture in the aqueduct. It had split in two at the foot of Mount Vesuvius. They were able to repair it and everybody was excited because we had running water again to all the establishments for all the visitors. However, the water smelled like rotten eggs, which was a puzzle to everyone living then. Those gathering wood on August 21 and 22 wrote that in gathering wood, there were snakes everywhere and they had never seen that before. And there were mice and moles and everything seemed to be scampering and crawling all over the ground for some reason. And they wrote about it later, several well-known springs of water that they were accustomed to getting water from the spring, they went to the spring and the ground seems to be sucking it all back in with a gurgling sound. Nobody could explain why this was. A flock of sheep watered the evening of August 21 at a very small lake near Mount Vesuvius had mysteriously died overnight and the lake had disappeared. Periodically, stinking whitish plumes of smoke spewed up out of the ground at various places. They reported it as ghosts. They would say they saw a ghost and it, were, it rose about 10 feet into the air. All the birds had disappeared. The sky seemed to be silent and animal behavior was perplexing, especially the continuous howling of the dogs and the piercing cry of the peacocks on the lawns of the very wealthy villas that were on the coast of the Bay of Naples. Oddly, horses and donkeys refused to enter their stables. They refused to eat. Those who owned boats noted sizable waves in the Bay of Naples, but there was no wind blowing. And they wondered how that could be. Then about a week prior to the Vulcan holiday, there arose a plume of white smoke from the top of Mount Vesuvius. It was observed and reported by people from all around the Bay of Naples. It could be seen for miles. People had no idea what this oddity was. Some people, even though they didn't understand what was happening, saw all these signs and thought the gods were warning them of something bad and they fled the area. But the majority saw nothing ominous whatsoever in the unusual happenings. They continued merrily with their lives, with their plans for the holiday. When Vulcan Day, August 23 came, people joyously feasted, partied, attended the arena games, visited the bathhouses, the gambling dens, 
participated in the behavior of their choice in whatever establishment that was, and it was an uproarious, joyous holiday. The night of August 23, 79 AD, the festivities were at their height. The bonfires, numerous and large, received hundreds of live fish as sacrifice to the revered god Vulcan, ending in orgies of the celebrants. Most revelers, because they had been up most of the night, slept late the morning of August 24th. Many didn't even awaken until noon or so. However, at 1 p.m. August 24, 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius erupted with a blast that propelled a 20-mile high mushroom cloud. Thousand-degree hot ash, poisonous gases, pumice into the air, and the reports say the noise was deafening. I'm reminded as I read the book, and this is, it's, the book Vesuvius is really interesting. As I was reading the book, came into my mind something in volume nine of the testimonies. It's on page 11, and it says this. Great changes are soon to take place in our world, and the final movements will be rapid ones. The final movements in Vesuvius were rapid. For 12 hours, the eruption continued, growing higher and higher until the mushroom cloud blotted out the sun's light. To their credit, many people fled as fast as they could to the water, up the beach, into boats to get away from this marvel that was happening. It seemed that this 12-hour period was given to people for escape. That's my interpretation. That's not what the book says. The, the book says it just hung there for 12 hours. And at 1 a.m., the mushroom cloud collapsed onto Mount Vesuvius down the slopes, and the first pyroclastic surge formed by a mixture of the gas and the ash flowed down the mountains over 100 miles an hour without pause for the next 12 hours. And it stopped around noon on August 25. Every living thing was buried. In Pompeii, it was buried under 17 feet. In Herculaneum, it was buried under 66 feet of the volcano material. Those who saw the signs and fled, lived. Those who saw the signs and procrastinated, perished. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah, wicked Pompeii and Herculaneum were gone forever and forgotten, literally. It wasn't until 1,669 years later, in 1748, that a farmer digging in his vineyard found traces of something that looked like pottery and gold, and he kept digging. And that was the beginning of uncovering Pompeii. To date, about two-thirds of Pompeii is uncovered. You can visit it. And about 20% of Herculaneum has been excavated. Beginning in 1982, the remains so far of 2,000 men, women, and children who were buried alive have been found in Pompeii. Their bodies decomposed under the hardened lava, leaving an empty shell in the exact position in which they died. I was reminded of something else as I'm reading the book. I'm reminded of the spirit of prophecy saying that you will come out of the grave with the last thought you had when you went into the grave. And I thought as I looked at these pictures, and I've been there and I've seen them, what were they thinking? Archaeologists filled these hollow shells with plaster, and as you can see, it reveals in grim detail 
the death pose of those who for some reason ignored the signs of impending destruction. This is an aerial view of Mount Vesuvius today. You can see the top of Pompeii. You can see the Bay of Naples. It remains the only active volcano on the European mainland. It last erupted in 1944. Today, there are over 700,000 people living in that death zone around Vesuvius. You and I live in a death zone that encompasses the entire world. Just as running away from the erupting Mount Vesuvius was the only way of escape for those people in Pompeii and Herculaneum, our only way of escape from the destruction that we know is racing towards us is by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus freely offers us the gift of salvation, which is eternal life. All we have to do is accept it. Accept him as our Lord and Savior. Surrender our lives to him. Let him guide our steps until he returns. Here's the thing. We are blessed in this church almost beyond all other denominations I could name you. For those of you listening and watching, we are blessed because we know prophecy. We recognize the warning signs. So why do so many seem so lackadaisical, so ho-hum about their salvation, about the salvation of the people they love? Why do so many seem to be putting off their lives instead of totally surrendering to Jesus Christ? If we ignore the signs and we procrastinate, we likely will meet the same fate as those who remained in Pompeii and Herculaneum. See, it's no accident that Satan wants us to bury prophecy. Why does Satan cause even Adventists to believe that we should only preach that Jesus loves us? And never mention the beast of Revelation 13. Satan doesn't want anyone to know the prophecy. He doesn't want everybody to know that all prophecy is Christ-centered. The last book of Revelation begins with the words, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, because Jesus loves us beyond our wildest imaginations, he told us, what's going to happen so we won't be like the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum who hadn't a clue that their destruction was imminent. Because of Jesus' great love for us, Bible students have known for centuries that Satan has been working behind the scenes to wipe the name of God off the face of this earth. He almost accomplished it when God destroyed the world by a flood. It's almost to that point again. Just look at the laws passed in America to legalize sin in many forms in absolute defiance of God's word. Each time a sin is legalized, it represents another tremor closer to final destruction. You know, one of Satan's greatest lies is to mix truth with error. For example, it goes like this. God loves you just as you are. True or false? It's true. You don't have to change. False. That's a lie. God specializes in changing us the minute we come to him. He died for your sins. True? True. Just relax and keep on what, doing what you're doing. Jesus died for you. True or false? False. The other lie that Satan loves to tell us is there's plenty of time. That's a lie. Just trust Jesus. That's true. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. That's a lie. 
There is something we have to do to be saved. We must surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. Jesus will not save us against our free will. Don't think we can live any way we want to and we'll be saved because Jesus went to the cross and died for our sins. Yes, he did. But we confess our sins to him and he will save us. Absolutely true. But he won't save you against your will. Okay, can we really be happy if we're saved? Thousands around us are lost. As I watch prophecy unfold, I believe time is running out. I think we are barreling forwards to Revelation 13, 7 and 8. I want you to listen to the words of this prophecy. Then I'm going to tell you something that starts tomorrow and will happen this week. Here are the words of Revelation 13, 7 and 8. And it was given it, and it was given authority over every tribe, and people, tongue, and nation. And all those who dwell on the earth will worship it. This predicts a one world authority controlling everything. Now, as most of you know, the United Nations was established in 1945. I have to tell you this to get to what I want to tell you. It was established to maintain peace and security of all nations. 193 countries belong to the United Nations. It is housed, headquartered in New York, in the UN building. The current Secretary General is Antonio Guterres, and he is the quasi-leader of the free world. Guterres was Portugal president, a Catholic, served as head of the Portugal Socialist Party before being voted to be head the Secretary General Head of the United Nations. Now, who cares? I'll bet some of you wonder that. We care because of the organizations Guterres oversees. He oversees the World Court, the World Bank, and the World Health Care Organization that we call WHO among several other things. Keep in mind that the United Nations has their own army and the power to enforce its laws. In 1992, the United Nations held an Earth Summit meeting in Rio and George H.W. Bush signed for the United States to join the United Nations in their global agenda to unite the world to protect the global environment. And that involved carrying out the United Nations mission of 17 goals of sustainable development. You've heard me talk about that before. Look up sustainable goals, 17 goals to transform the world. Look it up. The entire process is to be in place by the year 2030. In 1992, our nation, along with 193 others, began participating in recycling, adding climate change to school curriculum, began the ecumenical movements, such as the John 17 movement, with the goal of uniting all religions on the points upon which we can all agree. Implementation of the global goal of sustainable development are tremors. They're the warnings. But the latest happening is now. Starts tomorrow, this coming week. And this is not an earth tremor. This is a thin line of smoke coming out of the top of the prophetic volcano right before our eyes. On January 18, 2022, with no media coverage whatsoever, the White House quietly sent the United Nations Provisional Agenda 16.2, giving the World Health Organization the power to declare health care emergencies 
in any nation at any time. And member nations will be required by the international court to obey, even if the nation opposes it. This effectively removes the independence and sovereignty of the United States <clears throat> from we, the people. And our own government has submitted this change to the UN's constitution. It will come up for a vote, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this week. If it does vote, if, and I, they already have 50 some nations signed on to vote yes, if it is voted into the Constitution of the United Nations during this 22 to 28 um, General Assembly, the World Health Organization will be in charge of all health care in the United States. And if you don't think that's a tremor, you need to think carefully. And I think every one of us this week should pray that the vote is not unanimous. Here's a big problem. This is the first non-physician director of the World Health Organization. He's a man called Tedros. Before becoming the World Health Organization director, he was a Marxist activist from Ethiopia and he was installed into this position by the Chinese Communist Party. If the provisional agenda 16.2 passes next week, he will have absolute power over the world's health care. He can require anything he chooses from masks to sheltering. He can close schools, factories, anything he deems to be a health risk. And he will have the power through our health care system to bring America to its knees. And I think all of us should be informed. Do you know how I know this? Because I sign up for the World Health Organization newsletters that I get constantly. In his book, God and the World to Come, Pope Francis called for a new world order. He says that justice can be healed by building a new world order based on solidarity, eradicating bullying, poverty, and corruption with all working together. Under the new world order, the Pope calls for a worldwide green Sabbath, meaning every person on earth, with the exception of critical health care employees, policemen, and firemen, will be required by law to rest on Sunday. On the screen is Tucker Carlson reporting on the Pope's Green Sabbath announcement. Everything I've said can be fact-checked. Go fact-check me. Because neither the United Nations, nor the Pope, nor the World Economic Forum, which Pastor Alberg gave to you in a presentation, what's going on with money, all of this can be fact-checked. And not one of them, in any way, shape, or form, are trying to hide the fact that they are working towards a one-world government, one new world order based on global control of just about everything. Prophecy says, and it was given authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation, and all those who dwell on the earth will worship it. It's shaping up into the it being the one world power over every human on earth. Many of you are familiar with this little story illustration about Satan calling his evil angels together 
and asking them, how in the world can we get people to reject the call of God on their lives? One angel said, tell them there's no heaven. Satan said, that's not going to work. The Bible says there's a heaven. That's not going to work. Another angel says, well, tell them there's no hell. And Satan said, that won't work either. The Bible tells them there's a hell. And after much thought, a third angel raised his hand and said, tell them there is no hurry. Aha, Satan said, that'll work. See, I suggest this morning that when it comes to our personal salvation, the salvation of those around us, there is a very big hurry. There's an urgency because none of us knows. I, I started to say none of us knows what tomorrow will bring. None of us knows what two hours from now will bring. Consider the urgency of Jesus Christ. In Mark 1, verses 14 to 20, we're told that Jesus is walking beside the Sea of Galilee and he sees two fishermen. Simon and his brother Andrew casting their nets into the water and Jesus said hey come and follow me I'll make you fishers of men at once they left their nets and followed Jesus they didn't ponder the invitation they didn't talk it over when Jesus had gone a little bit further he saw James and John they're in the boat with their dad and their hired laborers and they're mending nets and Jesus looked at them and said come follow me they immediately dropped their nets, left their dad, and followed Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's always amazed me that the disciples Jesus called responded without any hesitation. He was asking them to leave their livelihood, leave their families, leave the communities that they grew up in, follow a man they didn't know into a future that they couldn't see. That says a lot about Jesus, but it says an awful lot about the kind of people he calls into his service. The book of Mark shows us Jesus, who is in a hurry, a man with an urgent message. Mark used one word in his gospel more than any other. He used the word immediately 40 times in 16 chapters. The last thing Jesus wants is a procrastinator. How do I know? Let's read Luke. Luke 9 says, Jesus gives a man an opportunity to follow him. And the man says, okay, Lord, I'd like to follow you. But first, let me go bury my father. Remember what Jesus said? Let the dead what? Go bury their dead. You proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another, I'll follow you, Lord. But first, let me go say goodbye to my family. Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks backwards is fit for the kingdom of God. All right, how are we responding today? Are we ignoring the Holy Spirit's call in our mind? I challenge you. I challenge you to find one place anywhere in the New Testament where Jesus told a prospective follower, you go home and think it over and get back to me. You won't find it. There's an urgency today as we feel the tremors, not only about our personal spiritual preparation for Jesus soon coming, but about sharing end time prophecy with the world. They have no idea out there what's gonna happen. We're sitting here and we do. We know all the prophecies. One third of the Bible is prophecy. God gave it directly to mankind as evidence of his love and his mercy and his grace. Because without prophecy, we would be like the rest of the world. We would have no idea of what's coming or how it's going to come. Without prophecy, procrastination would be easy. We feel no urgency whatsoever to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We would be in the final destruction without even knowing what's happening. As the tremors increase and the signs of impending disaster grow stronger, are we putting off a decision to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ? 
I talked with a man recently, my husband was there, and he said he was in college, Adventist college, and he was afraid, he didn't want the Lord to come because he wanted to experience some things before Jesus came. So he wanted Jesus to put it off till he could get married, until he could own a car, until he could do this and that. Looked at him and said, dumb. Everything in heaven is better than anything you think you can get on this earth. That includes marriages and a car. Heaven is so much better than anything we can imagine. Are we watching the thin spiral of smoke out of the prophetic volcano and procrastinating? You see, the danger is that we, like those in Pompeii and Herculaneum, will be lost in the suddenness of Jesus coming. All right, what about all of us that already follow Jesus? We know the prophecies. We follow Jesus. Should we be fearful as we see the prophecies fulfilling? Heavens, no. No. We continue to prepare ourselves spiritually well. At the same time, we become God's hands and feet and eyes and ears in the world with, with a mission to proclaim God, to proclaim this end-time prophetic message to millions of people who don't know him. My fear is that our church knows the prophecies. We grew up with them. Most of us did. How many of you grew up in the church? We grew up with them, didn't we? We know we should share God's love, mercy, and grace. We know Jesus is coming soon. But we get so caught up in what we're doing at the present moment that we fail to take action. And we fail to even think of witnessing. It reminds me of the ten virgins in Jesus' parable. We all know this too in Matthew 25. All are waiting for the bridegroom to come. They had no idea how long he would be. We know the bridegroom is Jesus. There were five wise. They brought extra oil representing the Holy Spirit. They're ready when he arrived. Five thought they had plenty of oil and plenty of time. Jesus' story ends with the sad news that five unprepared, Jesus calls them foolish, young ladies were denied entrance into heaven's banquet. If we let procrastination take root in our lives, it grows into a serious character flaw that can cause us to miss eternal life. An incident in the American Revolution illustrates another tragedy resulting from procrastination, at least for England. Colonel Raw, commander of the British troops in Trenton, New Jersey, was playing poker when a courier brought an urgent message. Now the message stated that George Washington and all of his troops are crossing the Delaware River, but he didn't read the message. It was Christmas day, it was in the evening, he had what he believed to be a winning poker hand. He put the note in his pocket. He didn't read it until the early morning hours when the poker game was over. Then, realizing the seriousness of the situation, he hurriedly tried to rally his sleeping men, but his procrastination was his undoing. He and almost all of his men were killed the rest were captured just after daylight, December 26, 1776, by General Washington's surprise attack. Just a few hours delay cost Colonel Rawl his life, his honor, and the death of almost every man in his regiment. You know, Earth's history is strewn with the wrecks of half-finished plans and procrastinated intentions. Just like the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, Jesus' second coming is going to break on the world as an overwhelming surprise. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 says, when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes. 
As God's children, we need to feel a burning desire to help everyone escape the destruction, especially when we hear and see the tremors daily. Because of our position with prophecy, we're in a unique position to offer other people invaluable biblical explanations for why the world is unraveling as it is. To our family, our friends, our neighbors, we can speak truth and hope in a world that is spiraling into chaos under Satan's rule. We can pray for them and with them. We can share the joy in Jesus' soon coming, in the salvation he so freely gives to everybody that will submit their lives to him. Luke 21, 28 says that when we see these things come to pass, then we look up. Why do we look up? Do you remember? Look up, lift up our heads, for our redemption draweth nigh. 